welcome to Live Unique. My name is Lorenzo Agnes. My goal is to help you unlock your truth. We seek to answer life's two most important questions. Who must I be and what must I do? I interview leaders from all walks of life and we have great conversations where I'm trying to understand and to discover how it is that they express their own particular uniqueness. If you would like to know more, please head over to the website liveunique.biz. That's L-I-V-E dot B-I-Z. It's my absolute joy to welcome to our leadership conversation today, Mike Sakosho a very good and dear friend and somebody who I have looked up to for many, many, many years. And you'll understand why as we go through the conversation. Um, Mike, it's great to have you here today. Thank you, Lorenzo. I'm excited to be with you and really been looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Mike, can you just give our listeners a little bit of an idea of, of what you do right now? I am the Executive Director of City Mission of Schenectady. And so that basically means running providing both um, operational and strategic leadership for an organization, about a $5 million budget, <clears throat> offering shelter for people, but really hopefully pathways of transformation for men, women, and children who are in poverty. That has really expanded, though, to now go from the confines of City Mission Campus throughout the city of Schenectady in the capital region, in which I think what we're really learning to do is help under-resourced men and women build sustainable careers that always, always, always include being leaders and giving back, contributing to community life. So we're doing that in really neat partnerships with the different sectors in the community, with Excellent. business, with the faith-based community, mm. with local government. So you work uh, with, with churches and government we and are. business. We, we believe there's eight sectors in the community, wow. and, and our nice. goal is to really, when appropriate, when organic, uh, right. not contrived, but to work with each sector as opportunity arises. And they work together with each other? There, there's a lot of working together. I think if you can do a good job building trust and then establishing kind of the natural mm, mutual benefit, it's not hard to work together as a team. So is this city mission like a hub for all of these other elements? I, I think it has. I think we came to a crossroads a few years ago. It was, a, it was an aha moment for me and for the mission to realize the real goal was not to try to gain formal authority in the community, but rather to gain influence. Wow. And, and when you're seeking hmm. to gain influence as opposed to position right. or formal authority, a lot of doors become open. Right. It's a very different process, but a very exciting and energizing one. How did, how did you come to that aha moment then? We saw through some things we were doing um, that we're gaining community attention, where people were coming to us saying, we've heard about your success, we've heard about your effectiveness, we'd like to partner with you. And, and my first instinct, seeing it as, okay, I'll try to build this the same way you build an organization. Right. But I grasped quickly, there's a difference between organizational authority, which is formal and good and necessary, right. and community which is really kind of more moral authority right. or influence. Once we started growing, we realized if we're going to try to hold this in a formal way, right. um, we're mm. not really going to build trust. That's People profound. will deduce mm -hmm. that we're kind of doing this for our own benefit. But if we go for influence, which really the key is being servants, right. being listeners, helping other people's goals be realized, there's almost no limit right. to how much influence we can have. Now, so was this something that you... One day, what, you're reading a book, I know you're a strong Christian, you're studying yes. the scriptures, you went to a conference, you were listening to you too. What, what was it that, what was the spark? It's a great question. It's hard to define a single moment. I, I think I try to be organic in my leadership, okay. so it's hmm. not like there was yes. this crystal clear vision that we're marching towards, but more a desire each and every day to say, okay, Lord, we know you're moving. Right. Give us eyes to see you, okay. ears Beautiful. to hear you, and hearts mm. to follow you. And although mm. we do that 
inherently and perfectly, if we're faithful in it, you start making progress and different doors begin to open mm-hmm. and there's a sense, this is the next door to go through. Very so I think nice. it was really that process where an unexpected vision was emerging and right. becoming increasingly clear. And do you think that that process necessarily actually needs to happen? Because it does seem to be more of a process than a journey, right? Yes, very right. much. I, I think there is a process. I think that I'm a, I'm a very big believer in sitting down and doing vision casting and thinking strategically and trying to understand and anticipate trends. But coming from a Christian faith-based perspective, it's really all about the unfolding of the kingdom of God in our right. midst. And it is impossible to sit in my office and know what God is going to be right. doing. Right. But I can develop, and then we corporately can develop greater sensitivity of sight, greater Mm. sensitivity of listening, Mm. and greater ability and willingness to move forward boldly when those opportunities arise. Mm. Well, with you particularly, I'd like us to focus um, very intentionally specifically on leadership. What is it? How does it work? You know, what's good about it? What's difficult about it? So can we go right back to the beginning and tell us where you were born? Like, what was your upbringing like? What's your background? What's the soil that you come out of? I was born right here in Schenectady, New York, so actually in Rotterdam. So um, attended schools, grew up in a home where faith was ever present. It was um, a Catholic home, and that was a great blessing. Uh, so God was always there. Right. I wouldn't describe it as necessarily having a personal relationship. And were you aware of that as a child? Very much. Yeah. I I really don't can't recall a day in mm. which God wasn't part of my That's thinking. Beautiful. Now, like most people, particularly growing through adolescence, you drift away. Mm -hmm. You um, become much more attuned to peer pressure Mm -hmm. and that type of thing as opposed to uh, what God would want. So there there was that growing process, Mm -hmm. and mine was similar. But after high school, went to Union College here in Schenectady Mm -hmm. and always had a dream of of working in government. I wanted to be in politics. Wow. That, w- that was my heart's desire. So you were aware of that as a young person? Or I you? was, yeah, very right. much. Certainly through high school, this was something that hmm. was interesting to me. So leadership is part of that, right? right? So kind of a, a love of history, wanting to study leadership, wanting to be a leadership in amongst my own peers. Honestly, though, the first season of that leadership was much more how do you win approval, right? which we know now right. is not really leadership, right, right. but it was it was a good training ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think being a teenager or early 20s, it was productive, mm-hmm. but like anything in life, hopefully we look back at those things and say, well, that was quite adolescent or immature, right. but it was still a beginning, right, so I don't right. despise it at all. Right. Um, good seed sowing time. It is. So, it is yeah. good seed sowing, and it also... It's always good in life to understand how many seasons you were completely convinced you knew what you were doing, right. only to discover you right. didn't. It good. really does make sure that humility permeates us now, even when maybe we've Very had good. some success, to still realize, I still, there's only a few things I absolutely know to be true. Right. Everything good. else really requires that even when I'm moving forward in some confidence, Again, I have to really be looking and mm-hmm. listening because I could be off the track. Right. But I'm convinced that that God always brings us back mm-hmm. to, to the right path. So I had a slight um, deviation in my professional career. I, I played baseball. I played professional baseball for a few years. That was a different type of leadership. Now, was that a was that an interest or love? Yes. Was that, that done out of because you just like baseball? You're or? Using a biblical phrase, that was my first love. Okay. Right. <laughs> just that was my great love to to play baseball, and it was something I just enjoyed doing. So you so wanted much. to do that. Your dream was it to was. be in the majors yes. and playing for a big team. And Absolutely, and it was even more than that for me because, particularly when I went to college and um, didn't have the same social support system found myself in some pretty lonely periods. Baseball was always something I could hold to and say, I'm Mm -hmm. good at this, I have this. And Mm -hmm. it really was the one thing that I could could work towards beyond academics. So it was the first time that I ever set a goal that was beyond my reach. Mm -hmm. And and then by God's grace and a lot of hard work, actually achieved it. So the day I became a professional baseball player, it really convinced me because... 
<clears throat> I, when I left high school, I don't think a single person thought that was possible. Right. So that's a good thing for a young person right. to experience. So right? what age? What, what age were you? I, I became a professional at age twenty-one. And were you in that setting? Were you already manifesting leadership tendencies? I believe I was absolutely. Still, kind of saw myself as someone that others would follow, but again, in a way that was kind of based more on wanting to be popular. Right. So again, mm. it was a it was a immature leadership, mm-hmm. but leadership nonetheless. And you were conscious of that. I was. See, that's am- yeah. Because the comment on this is, you know, the the discussion that's been going on for years and years and years, probably decades, are leaders born or are they made? So because of my own particular theology and when I think of Romans 12 particularly where it talks about what I would term the father gifts, the the things that God the Father puts in us to manifest him through our lives, and it talks about giving, mercy, charity, administration, one of them is leadership. I believe that yes, every almost everybody can be taught to lead but like with other things in life, I believe leaders are born. Yes. Do you agree, disagree? What's your take? On I certainly that? believe there are leadership traits, leadership mm-hmm. gifts that are are with us at birth. They, they are God-given. Right. Beautiful. Um, and it is mm. possible someone just wouldn't have those and therefore maybe could never be a great leader. Right. But I think the thrill of leadership is that even with those gifts, it is the constant growing and learning. I say right. the thing that perhaps is most exhilarating about my job right now is how much room I have to grow as a leader. Right. So even this year at the start of 2016, and I've been in my position for almost 20 years, my theme for the year was earn the position. Wow. In other words, recognizing mm. there's a whole other level of leadership. That's Rather beautiful. looking back and saying, mm-hmm. I've got, this position is pretty secure because of the past 19 years. No, let's start this year, as a single year, mm. what kind of leader do I need to be to truly earn being in this position? Right. So I love the fact that every day there's a bar to raise right. and to grow, what, and hoping to mature as a leader. What was your conclusion? Like, did you write down a list just to be helpful for our listeners? Yes. Practically, what did that look like? I, I, I think the the list was really trying to build it around how did Jesus, what does the kingdom of God leadership look Mm -hmm. like, daring now in middle age to be a radical follower of Jesus' radical Mm -hmm. leadership teachings. That really, if he says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute Mm -hmm. you, really if he says to his disciples when he washes their feet, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher and Lord, have right. washed your feet, you also should Goodness. wash one another's feet, right? <laughs> now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Right. So it really was this thing. Okay, there's been a lot of knowledge gleaned over the years. It has to come down to doing them right. in a radical way. Reaching the point for me that if this stuff isn't true... I think I'm washed up as a leader anyways. Right. So why not put it to the ultimate right. test? And that Very really good. what this goal was going to wow. be. Mm. Servant leadership. I like to think, Lorenzo, more what I call shepherd leadership. Mm-hmm. I think servant leadership can get lost That's a little beautiful. bit. So I like the mm. metaphor this. of shepherd mm-hmm. leadership because it has a couple elements to it. First of all, the shepherd is responsible to the owner. Right. Okay, so the shepherd realizes my job is not necessarily to to have a certain level of popularity amongst the flock. It is, am I being faithful to what the Mm. owner has charged me to? Secondly, there is a great love for the flock. There is a passionate willingness to to lay down one's own Mm. immediate benefit in order to benefit them. So that that the hierarchy is very clear. Mm -hmm. The owner and the flock... And, and then self. And thirdly, it is the notion that value, satisfaction comes in fu- successfully fulfilling one's duty. Right. Whether there's appreciation, mm-hmm. that's nice. But if mm-hmm. there is an appreciation, um, a shepherd answers to something different. Right. So beautiful. I've really been beautiful. developing that. And that has been much more helpful to me because I think things like servant leadership can minimize things like courage right okay right. like perseverance mm-hmm. like good. standing against 
uh, what may be looking Very popular. Good. So yes. it, it's an image that I've been developing a lot and hopefully trying to model. I've always understood you to be somebody to take the high road. Even, even if that road is much more difficult, mm-hmm. more energy draining, time consuming, you know, it's always one of the, one of the reasons I've always looked up to you. Thank and, you. And always will. Um, as, okay, so after your baseball stints, because then I know you left that to go into politics, right? I, I left because it, it left me first. Okay. Okay, people always ask me, why did you give up baseball? I said, well, I gave it up the moment after I got a letter saying I'd been released. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like the joke, nobody really gives that up. It gives you up. Right, Maybe right. there's a handful of players that choose to give it up right. while it's still going. Well, they are the great exceptions. For me, that door was closed. Okay. I just wasn't good enough to reach the highest level. Was that tough to That was very hard. And, and because it's not the loss of a job, it's the loss of a dream. A dream yes, you've been holding love. on since you were five. Five years That's old. Good. So that took me a year mm. to really let go of it finally. Mm. But that turned out to be a blessed year because I worked construction. I was deep. I was the lowest man in I the blue know. collar world. Um, it taught me some real lessons mm. about about identity. Mm-hmm. Um, I had gone from a place where I was signing autographs for people wow, to a place where my job was to sweep up after people after they had thrown their garbage on the floor right. while they ate lunch. And I went through mm-hmm. a very painful process in which my identity was tied up in the former. Mm-hmm. So therefore was kind of literally in the trash mm-hmm. in the latter scene. Wow course the great breakthrough came when i realized neither was my identity right and my identity was going to be in christ right and That's that was beautiful. the beginning of a new liberation for mm. me and really in a sense of quantum leap as were you second. embarrassed by I was, the change yes i was embarrassed by um the failure because it was it was a public failure mm-hmm. okay it was high profile failure and i was embarrassed because i no longer had a distinctive mm-hmm. amongst my peers um it's one thing to be the laborer on a construction site when you're also a professional athlete. Right, 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 okay? right. It's That's different beautiful. when there is mm. no other. This right. is this just is what it. you are. Right. Okay, so... Were you treated differently? Yes, very much so. Very much so. So that's, that's an unforgettable experience, how differently I was treated based on the fact that I was physically dirty. Yeah. Right and really experienced. Oh my goodness! And how did you? If I can ask yeah. this, uh, part of these conversations, by the way, is that we are unafraid to be transparent because yes. it helps us all to learn, right? Right. Um, uh, you, were you married at this point? I was not. Kids? No, I was oh, single at this point. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you how did yeah. your wife appreciate the trans- yeah. transition? <laughs> no, I'm sure because of who she is, she would have been a blessing in the midst right. of it. Of but course. um, no, it was just me. Um, but it really left me with a deep sense of what it felt like to be treated differently right. simply because of the way I was dressed or the work I was doing. And I have passionately carried that. I've been at City Mission 27 years, and I have a couple simple rules. And one of them is anytime I ask somebody to do something, if it's one of our residents, that I always say, please. Yes. And then if they do it, to make sure I say thank you. Those are, those are simple. Those oh, are kindergarten no, rules, out. right? Found. But it was always... Right flows from that notion. Right. I remember what it was like when mm-hmm. people, you could see it in their eyes that they didn't think anything right. of you. And to never, by yeah. God's grace, to never pass right. that on to, to another person, but isn't rather it, seek to lift Isn't them. it marvelous? I'm not sure what other word to use, how God the Father intentionally puts us into yes. places, not only that we would not prefer, yeah. we actually end up questioning I mean, Father, if you love me so much, what am I doing here? You know, I went through that four years ago. Dara and I have suffered suffered, um, small S. Yes. Uh, I like to say to her, if ever either of us complain, you know, we didn't wake up in Syria this morning. And I don't mean it in a trite way. Right, right. Um, And how some of the struggles we've gone through in our mid-stage of life, um, actually it's been spectacular. My, Mm. My... Attitude is how amazing that God would entrust us yes. with these tests and lessons, which are actually for our benefit, of course, because He's always has the eternal picture in mind. And praise the Lord that He would yes. trust us with it. He thinks we are ready after thirty years. It, it, it is, you know, it is to grace finally plus. go through this. It's amazing. It is isn't grace it? plus, and I have 
three leadership principles that I share a lot, but the first principle is adversity creates the best opportunities. Mm, that is beautiful. just, you just come to truly embrace that. It doesn't mean that you're looking for adversity. It means, right. hey, if things are going well, celebrate it, do the best you can with it, be grateful for it. But when adversity comes and it hits all of us, I am absolutely convinced that yeah. God plants the Beautiful. seeds of mm. new opportunities that we never could have realized had it not been adverse. Right. Something in our creativity, mm. something in our hearts, something in our resolve can grow to a new level. And adversity is the environment, is the reality that, that grows us in that mm. way. So all of my life has been that. That's pretty important at a place like City Mission where every man, woman, and child who comes is in adversity. Right. So it's not just we're going to make you comfortable right. or we're going to have compassion about your adversity, but something so much more, hopefully we do those things, but something so much more compelling, the God we serve can use your adversity for your next great Beautiful. opportunity. As mm-hmm. we like to say here at the mission, God will, can, wants to transform your wounds into your assets, Mm -hmm. your struggles into your strengths. And I quote one of our graduates, God has made my mess my message. Wow, that's beautiful. So these are just great Mm. truths that we get to live in the midst of. And Mm. and that's what makes every day a a new potential and a very exhilarating journey, Mm -hmm. even when it's all uphill and seems to be failing. What are the other two principles? The the second principle is one that um, our mutual friend Greg Groh taught me. And Greg is a man of big vision, of global vision. But he said, Mike, in the kingdom of God, if you want to make an impact that is truly big, you have to think and act truly small. Hmm. It is this paradoxical truth of the kingdom of God that the way big things are done are by doing very small, seemingly ordinary Mm -hmm. things with great love. Mother Teresa, Mm -hmm. who went from really nothing to global impact and influence, said, our work is simply this. We do small things with great love. Wow. Same principle. Beautiful. It is maybe mm. the most life transforming truth if we as individuals would embrace it. Mm-hmm. So what it means is if I believe that all of life is sacred. Mm-hmm. So this conversation is sacred. Mm-hmm. I can go to Starbucks for a cup of coffee. It's a sacred moment. Right. I can choose to squander it. Mm-hmm. I can choose to ignore it. Or I can choose to be fully present in even the exchange of coffee for dollars. Mm-hmm can be done with great love. That's beautiful. And so mm-hmm. what I really think I, wow. I've gotten good at, even though there's a lot of room mm-hmm. for improvement, is to so discipline my mind mm-hmm. that there are no small moments. Mm-hmm. There are no ordinary That's moments. Beautiful. They're all sacred wow. and opportunities. So in my job, although there's big things on my desk, I, I say the most important part of my day is when I pull in that parking lot walk the half block to my office, I can choose to either wave to people, right. nod to them, ignore them, right. or stop. Yes. Look them in the eye. Hmm. Call them by name. Mm-hmm. Handshake. Hug. Mm-hmm. Word of encouragement. Yeah. And really, Lorenzo, with all my heart, I believe, hmm. if that is all day, every day, it is less tiring, mm-hmm. and it is the stuff where great impact it's is actually made. profound. Wow. So that's when I really encourage our listeners to get serious about because what it also means is one of the traps in life is sometimes we are precluded from doing big stuff, at least what the world would see as big. It might be we lack the credentials. We lack the physical capacity. We lack the opportunity. All those things. We are never precluded Mm -hmm. from doing small things of great love. That's stunning. Right? I can do that. All day, every day. And, and that, ev- that's be- everybody that's can do that. Everybody can do that. Yeah. The more a man or woman, mm-hmm. young or old, embraces that, I am absolutely convinced they mm. will begin to see that's a growing wow. influence and an impact beyond even what their vision was. Although, mm-hmm. it'll certainly look different. Mm-hmm. And then the third principle is another paradoxical <laughs> kingdom of God principle that helping others is the best way to help ourselves. Mm-hmm. It, what that simply means is it's not just a good thing to do, but that it really is the best thing we can do for us. Right. It is inherently both selfless mm-hmm. and a little bit selfish. It reminds me of that verse, you know, where Jesus says, because I, I didn't come to be served, I came to yeah. serve. And I don't know, I've read that 300 times, maybe yes. more. 
And it's only recently in the last two years or so that it just smacks me in the face because the one perfect sinless leader, the greatest leader of all time, uh, the most selfless, uh, knowledgeable, holy, et cetera, et cetera, right? Completely other centered in that he lived to glorify his father and for the good of all mankind. Like that's the coin that I, I'm trying to live my life right, by, yes. right? Lord, I want to bring you glory and how can I help people, whether they know you or don't know you yet? And again, paradoxically, the one person who rightfully could have said, no, you guys need to serve me because of what I've done for you while I was in heaven and what I'm going to do for you while I'm on earth and then for eternity. And yet his whole message was like, no, no, I I came to serve you. You know, I don't come with an expectation. I mean, it's nuts, right? It's so completely opposite. We've got to stop resisting that or thinking we can improve upon it. But really say if if that is how the master came to display how to be impactful and and to be beautiful, then let's just do it, right? Let's now but those that involves really coming to grips with identity. Mm -hmm. If our identity is in position, if it's in popularity, Mm -hmm. if it's in these things, it's very hard to continue to be a servant. Mm -hmm. But the more my identity is rooted in, I am a child of the living God, beloved, beloved child Mm -hmm. of the living God, then the more I am freed up. And I believe that Jesus said the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve that we could maybe say dot, 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 and to live abundantly. Mm-hmm. That, that is see, right. the, the great falsehood mm-hmm. is that, okay, that's what you're supposed to do, but it inherently diminishes my joy right. for the good of others. Very good. No, mm-hmm. no, it will involve... Actually, that's where your joy is actually it, found. It's, where, it, it's what builds joy. Right. Again, paradoxically, because mm-hmm. in the moment, you, yes, you are choosing to defer pleasure, Mm -hmm. to defer um, something for yourself. Mm -hmm. But the kingdom works in time. And in Mm -hmm. time, what you sense is a release, more joy, Mm -hmm. more abundance. So it is not only the right thing to do because it obeys the the principles that that the master has taught. It is also the pathway to abundant living and, and to human flourishing. That's beautiful. You ended up in politics, right? Yes. Um, for our listeners, I've always said about Mike, and it sounds funny, but I mean it seriously. I wish he'd run for president because <laughs> we actually really need him. Um, and tell us a little bit about that journey, your journey in politics as a leader. I did. When I came out, I actually got a master's degree in public policy. So again, when I was done playing baseball, finished construction, went off to graduate school, got a job in the New York State Legislature. Um and just loved that job. I was working at the state capitol. Um, there was a good energy there. Exciting. I, I just loved it. Yeah. I loved every bit of it. And out of nowhere, um, was called to work at City Mission. We don't have time to go into that story. It's a good story, though. Uh, first, I rejected the offer, but then had my heart changed and received the mm-hmm. offer. Two years after that, I was... Um, offered the position of being the deputy mayor of the city of Schenectady. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of in a little microcosm. It was me letting go of what had been my heart's desire, politics, to go what I believe was what God was calling me to. And then the political prize was brought right back to me. I wasn't pursuing it. And so then I I then had the opportunity. So sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Would you, does it make sense to say then that the Lord always intended that maybe the timing was wrong or... You know, I don't know. It's a, it's a great question. <clears throat> I, I, I've come to believe that, that God, can t- it's what grace is. We make decisions. Sometimes they're the right ones. Sometimes they're the wrong ones. But God creates opportunities right. even on that that's wrong beautiful. path. Because that's what love is. Mm, that's what love we're not, is. We're not being stubborn. Right, right. You know, it just means, right, God, right. I'm seeking you. I'm searching for you. And, and I discerned wrongly. Right. God's not angry with that. Right, right. That's not that's God. That's profound. Right? It's wow. God saying, okay, well, okay. I'm going to I'm going to now steer you and create new opportunities. Mm-hmm. Now there might be some pain. Um there might be a, a, some, some prices to pay, but, but God's always fulfilling. That's beautiful. Right? His mm-hmm. his plan for our yeah. lives if if we stay open. So I think it's just something that was offered to me. I took the job as deputy mayor. Uh it's a great story. I was not living in Schenectady. Mm-hmm was not pursuing it, was working at City Mission, mm. living in Glenville, New York. Um, no 
political activity, no connections whatsoever. But through a series of events, I was given that position. And again, a little funny anecdote, my first week on the job as deputy mayor, the mayor, who was an elderly man, had gotten sick and actually had to go into the hospital and required some medication that required uh, some legislation making me what they call mayor pro tem of Schenectady, which is the acting mayor because the mayor was under medication. So I remember walking down J Street in downtown Schenectady saying, now, wait a minute, two weeks ago, I'm living in Glenville, working at City Mission. I am now the acting mayor of the city of Schenectady. So it was humorous. <laughs> but I, I kind of always sensed, even while doing it, it was a great adventure. Hardest thing I've ever done. I did in, it for two in, and a half in years. What way? Just in terms of being a little bit, being way out of my comfort zone, hmm. uh, having responsibility beyond what my training was, mm-hmm. but it's what forced that adversity right. created. Very good. Wonderful opportunities. Mm. Um, but I felt even while I was doing it, my place was back to City right. Mission eventually. Right. And it turned out that's what happened. I had two and a half great years there. Uh, thank God for all of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, met wonderful people, got to be a part of some wonderful projects. But it was very clear to me throughout right. that it may have been Lorenzo, if we look at it in real hindsight, it may have been God, Grace saying, this is not what you're going to be doing. Right, right. Because, okay, that's an interesting point. Because also with some of the changes we've been through, um, I've been so used to all my Christian walk having a word from God. Yes. Whereas these last three years particularly have been more the Father saying, I don't mind if you do A or B. Mm. I love you. Right, And yes. uh, your identity in me, we've settled that long yeah. time ago. You, you choose. Yes. But having been so used to, as a leader... You know, right. no, no, but Lord, uh, this is this is what you made me to do, and you've always spoken to me clearly. I just was not prepared for at fifty for yes. God to say, "Well, I trust you. Right. You, you choose." You know, because yeah. it's an eternal journey. This right. is one tiny piece of right. it, and because your joy is in me, does it even matter what you really do? Right. Like just, you know. I think there's a lot of truth in that. <clears throat> I think sometimes we put tremendous pressure, and I, I, God is like almost like the person giving the test he's the proctor right. standing in front of the classroom and he's watching me take the test and if i don't pass then you know right. um i i think god just wants to move in our hearts and yeah. he gives us the freedom to to pursue journeys as long as we keep on learning right? yeah as long that's as the still key learning right? and listening Absolutely. not stubbornly saying no i even though there's god's clearly showing me something else this is what right. i want to do so it is it is a joyful journey can I ask you a couple of yes. difficult yes, questions great. as a leader? Yes. <laughs> You're very quick to say yes. I hope you won't beat me up after. <laughs> Have there been moments in your leadership at the City Mission? Because I remember the journey we had together with John Hadarowski, yes. uh, for our listeners' sake, an absolutely crazy but amazing visionary businessman, yes. and how you transformed the City Mission from what mm-hmm. used to be you know, right. a typical mission, lack of money, not a great facility, into this gorgeous, like, four-star quality hotel, yeah. just completely reversed mm-hmm. the, the, the thinking, right? And it's become a model for so many other missions. Um, it, it's, it's the premier example of anything like this I've seen anywhere in the world. But in spite of all the very significant, exciting things that you've done as a leader, what is what what are the two or three uh, greatest difficulties that you found? For example, have you ever been bored with the job? Have there ever been times when you thought, ah. I have never been bored with the job, not even for a day, but I have certainly have had seasons in which I felt that being here this long represented uh, underachieving. Hmm. And that sense of, while I thought it would lead right. to bigger Mm-hmm. And better things. I'll tell you one story, just because it has, it, it's yes. profound. Uh, we had started a program in downtown Skanky called the Ambassadors Program, where City Mission residents and I would go out with them. We provide hospitality services in downtown Schenectady. It's 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 a great program. It's, a it's done program. it's done some wonderful things. But a night came. It was January two thousand and nine, and it was the night of President Obama's first State of the Union address. Well. Give you some context. A guy that I went to graduate school with, he and I were close friends, and uh, we always talked about our dreams for politics. This man had been elected governor of Virginia. And on this night, 
he was going to give the Republican Mm -hmm. counter response to the President's State of the Union address. Now, all along, I'd been very pleased for my friend and excited for him, just so, so honored to have known him. But I remember sitting in my office that night, and I was going to volunteer as an ambassador. And I got hit with a very heavy, dark place that, oh my goodness. I mean, we sat together in that classroom. Mm-hmm. He is now giving the national response right. to the President's wow. address. And I'm still at City Mission, and I'm putting on this ambassador's coat, Mm -hmm. and I'm going out just to welcome people to downtown. Mm -hmm. And so that that was a very deep one for me Mm -hmm. where I really felt like, oh, my goodness. How did you come out of it? You know what? I I realized pretty quickly that it wasn't a professional crisis. It was an identity crisis. Wow. And they always are, Lorenzo. Talk about that. That... What, what hmm. really drifted was I had lost sight of what my identity was. Right. Again. That hmm. my identity was not governor, executive director, right. anything that's other beautiful. than beloved child Jesus, of the living beautiful. God. And, hmm. and I realized that over time that had eroded a little bit, which mm-hmm. really set me up for a grand disappointment. Mm-hmm. I don't think identity is ever felt in our hearts once and for all. I, I believe it's hmm. to a certain degree, it's almost a little bit like physical fitness. It has hmm. to be renewed. That's it, beautiful. It's, it's forever with God. That's profound. But in our own understanding hmm. of it, I think hmm. almost every day I have I've to never recalibrate my identity. Beautiful. Because if it's hmm. anything other than... So what we like to say here is it's the audience of one. Mm-hmm. Right? I, I'm on this stage as we all are every day. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, the way I act... And either the pleasure or disappointment from how I act is really going to be based on who's in my audience. Right. Very good. Right? And if I can get myself hmm. to the point where it's an audience of one, it is Jesus. Right. And, and my single goal is, Beautiful. is he pleased? Does he, does he watch the performance? Not that it's not stumbled over, not that lines aren't missed, but does he say, well done, what well played today? Yeah, that's then wow. I am fine. And so, dude, it, you know how profound that is. What well, you just said. Thank you. Wow, I, it, it, it's is. very real for me. So my way out of that darkness of that night mm-hmm. wasn't applying for new jobs. Even mm-hmm. though that would that could have been fine. It was realizing, go back mm-hmm. to my identity, mm-hmm. and that it's great that my friend has that opportunity if that's what Jesus right. is calling Lovely. to do. Lovely. But mine was, was equally... So it strips valid. away any sense of competition yes, or any beautiful. need for competition, yes. it strips away. comparison, all that stuff. Yeah, what, yeah. what Stephen Covey calls the five emotional cancers, yes. right? Yes. Comparison, <laughs> criticism, contending, competing, complaining. Very good. Right? But, Very but for good. me and maybe for guys like us who historically have been achievers were very vulnerable sure. to comparison. Well, <clears throat> after just briefly after stepping down from Calvary, very intentional yes. plan, 18 right. month plan, standing yep. ovation by the church and then it didn't yes. work out as we would have as we had planned. Yes. Um, and actually having four people, uh, two of them the your stereotypical little old ladies within two weeks of that happening and I'm still there in the building, I'm still part of the congregation. And then saying to me, well, what, what do we call you? What do I call you now? Mm. You know? mm. And I said, well, you know, my name's Lorenzo. And right. we, we, I tried to win that battle. Of just call me Lorenzo. Yes. That's my name. You did all Past all is my job type, right? right? Yes. And finally just gave up. It's too deeply embedded in the culture whatever. And they're like, but are you, like, are you a pastor still? And I said, yes, I'm credentialed and I am still fully a pastor. Yeah, but you're not, but you don't have a church anymore, mm. right? I mean, listen, loving people. Yes, I mean, right. They were literally confused as yes. to what do we call you now because now that you're not the senior pastor, you're not my pastor anymore. Yes. And I remember just very kindly and easily saying, well, really call me Lorenzo. Okay, Pastor Lorenzo. Yeah, right. you know, walking away, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's funny that it took me fully two, two and a half years for myself to wrestle with, yes. well, what the heck am I now? Right. You know, because yeah, right. that was so, even in the global family, this right. global network, even some of them were like, are you still not leading a church? And it was a good lesson both ways, you know, for yes. me to be able to say, guys, even when I was the pastor of a lovely church, which were the 15 happiest years of our lives in ministry, truly, it was a wonderful experience. Yes. Even then, do you remember how often I used to say to the church, 
my identity is in Jesus. And if he called me out of the full-time ministry to do graphic design, I'd right. be happy with it. Right. But by year three, I found myself questioning. Mm. Yes, I, I think don't think natural. this is what I was made to do. And, mm. you know, I, I can't say I was depressed about it, but there were definitely seasons of doubt and confusion, you know, and uh, etc. So, and yeah. wonderful, you know, now I look back in my, at the end of the fourth year and say, not only would I do it again, I'd gladly do it again because I've reached people for Christ that I never would have as a pastor. Right. Although even that could be an easy excuse, if you wish. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, truly, I personally, I've been reminded at the deepest level, not only that my identity is in Christ, but that He is Lord. And it doesn't matter what job I do for Him. Right. You know, right. I've never heard this audience of one thing. I'm taking yes. this away big time today. I really want to meditate on that. So thank you. Let me ask you, as a leader, particularly as a leader, what, what has your biggest struggle been as a leader? That's a great question. I, I think for me has been not to put on others what God is teaching me. Wow. One can very mm, easily very become good. vulnerable to pride and ego mm-hmm. by saying, God's teaching me this and I'm telling them and right. they're not living it. Therefore, they're not living what they should be right. before God. Hmm. So it is that balance of saying my job is to try to continually lift people right. to higher levels of them mm-hmm. reaching their potential, their God-given potential, both for organizational excellence as well as for their own lives. Right. Um, that's part of my stewardship of them. My shepherding of them is for them to, to see how God has gifted them and then mm-hmm. help them reach their full potential. But there's a difference between that and the pernicious encroachment of pride hmm. and ego saying I'm doing this and they're not and doing this. Do you think that danger is always there? I do. Hmm. I, I think it's I think it's always the backside of a new revelation. Right. Of a new understanding. Mm-hmm. It's the backside of a victory. Mm-hmm. Okay, that let's just say as, as people who are seeking God, God gives us insight into something and we really get a new discovery. We have this new truth that we're now being called right. to live out. So it's natural. I'm going to share it with you right. because that's I, I want to share that. But then if people aren't responding the way that right. I think they should respond to then fall in the trap of equating that they're not sold out for the Lord, mm-hmm. they're not committed or equally Dangerous. They don't appreciate me. Right. They don't appreciate Very me. Very good. I, one of my goals mm. as a leader wow, is, good. as well as just in living, is that I want to get to the point where I cannot be slighted. Mm-hmm. Okay. Where what do there, you mean? It means that there's nothing you can say about me or fail to invite me to something, right. fail to include me, okay. that I take as a personal okay. slight. Very good. Okay? Hmm. That otherwise, it's very easy to almost live in a chronic sense of hmm. lack. people don't appreciate right. what I'm doing. Right. They don't know the hours I'm putting in. Right. So I'm either going to be consumed with telling them all that mm-hmm. or, or feeling this chronic sense of um, people aren't doing what mm-hmm. I'm doing. Now, in many cases, they're doing more because I don't know what they're doing right. in the same way they don't know what I'm doing. So, But it's really saying that if my identity is properly connected and I am being a shepherd and, and listening to the voice of Christ in my life and the movements of the Holy Spirit, you can't slight me. Right. If, if you don't invite me to something, then oh, well. there must be good reason. Right, right. There must be good reason. And it saves you a lot of energy and time. It saves so much energy, oh. maybe energy more than anything. Now, still, I, was, I can still be hurt because right. the day we can stop being right. hurt, mm. we, we fail to be human. That's very good. So point. hurt, yes. That's very But not good. a slight, there's a difference between saying that hurt me versus saying I deserve better. Right. Maybe that's the phrase. That's very good. Right? Yes, no, I yes. don't just see if the yes. Lord offers us hmm. the perfect formula for growth in Christ. It's the best of both worlds. What happens is we move closer into the light, right? Mm-hmm. And and the result of moving closer in the light is we get new revelation, new insight, new knowledge, new application. And people really notice that. Mm-hmm. Wow, that person is really changing. But the balance is the more I come into the light, 
the more I realize my own condition. Very good. Yes. Right? The yes. more I'm aware. Which of, should easily keep us humble. It, it, it's yeah. Jesus's twofold formula. He never wants us to stop growing. Right. But if we were only aware of our growth, right. that has to lead to pride. Hundred percent. The thing that prevents mm-hmm. pride is the more I grow into the light, the more like Isaiah. Mm-hmm. Woe is me. Yeah. I'm a man of. It's interesting. Hey, from Isaiah right through to John. I mean, here's John. I love this this example. I've used it countless times because it is so utterly perfect and profound. Um, and in the book of Revelation, here yes. he is. I mean, he was closest to Jesus. Right. I mean, the one guy who shouldn't fall right. down in right. shock is John. Right. And Places his head on he, Jesus' breast you know, at the instant last supper. Best friend. He stays closest, faithful at the cross. You know, the right? one yes. man who's yes. there. And he sees Christ and yes. falls down. You know, he sees the risen Christ. That's in all a great example, Lorenzo. So he had the beatific vision, and yet I guarantee he was not prideful. No. When he came back to oh, be amongst yeah. the people, I right? Because how could he be? Just yeah. the opposite. Yeah. Jesus' plan for us is to simultaneously grow hmm. in knowledge, wisdom, strength of practice, and humility. Very good. Right? Oh, they 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 are not counter. Have you written a book on any of this stuff? I have not. What's no. wrong with you? Well, thank you for that. I've written a, a book which, um, you know, is okay. It's not, and I did it yeah, just as like an act of obedience. I'll send you a copy. I'd love to read it. And it wasn't, you know, it was. It's it's called uh, lingering lessons in life mm-hmm. and leadership, mm-hmm. and the idea that there are these lessons that are like yes. soulmates that yes, visit yeah. you every once in yeah. a while. And then realizing even writing the book, yes, these are things that Christ has done in me and put in me. This is part of my uniqueness, my essence. Yes. But they're very intentional from his perspective. Mm-hmm. And the goal always is to make me more like him. Yes. It's never about fame, fortune, right. Right. influence, even whatever. Completely. Well, let me ask you, let's flip that question, that last question around. Um, what do you think your greatest strength as a leader are? Is there one thing or two things that you can point to and say, okay, I think one strength I have, at least up till this point in my life, is I don't think I'm ever outworked. Hmm. So I'm very committed to paying the price. Hmm. Okay, that, that not not as some sense of being heroic, mm-hmm. not as others should be doing the same thing, mm-hmm. but a very intuitive grasp that hmm. saying yes to the position just means that I'm saying no to certain other right. things. And I am hmm. not gonna I, I won't get outworked. Right. Okay. Wow. That's so I think I think that's a good strength. And now it's I didn't have this when I was young, but now in middle age, I am ever more confident mm-hmm. of the truth of the kingdom. Beautiful. Of God. Yes. It's it. It's a lovely. It's almost place unfair. To be. <laughs> you know it's that's why it's place. not a. It's a feeling. Now what an advantage. Sometimes you actually hear brothers and sisters in Christ talk as if knowing and following Jesus is some disadvantage. Right. In the workplace, right. in the neighborhood, in politics, in whatever. Mm-hmm. When, in, when in fact, it's like it's almost like hiking in the woods, and one person has a compass, and seeing that as a disadvantage, mm-hmm. right? So it is. It is now this this growing certainty mm-hmm. that the truths of Scripture, the truths of the kingdom of God, if applied, mm-hmm. bear fruit, and they work. Um, immeasurably. And they work. And again, they, they create fruitfulness. Right. Not necessarily success. Right. Not necessarily what we mid- originally wanted. Very but good. they are inevitably fruitful. So, a live unique, you know, uh, the motto that I came up with, um, which I feel the Lord gave me, actually, because it's so profound and complete, is unlock your truth. So, mm-hmm. the whole goal of live unique is based on Psalm 139. And this reality it's not a thought or an idea it is true capital t that god formed you in your mother's womb you know even the idea that um, i understand that it's not that god gave me to my parents it's that god gave my parents to me Mm -hmm. and my Mm -hmm. grace so he has invested generations of Mm -hmm. people to produce me and so then we try to answer these two questions which i believe are, are life's or two of life's most important questions therefore if god made me uniquely I have to find my truth and answer these two questions. Who must I be and what must I do? Mm, mm. If you apply that to yourself, who must you be? What must you do? The one thing that I've learned that I must do is 
I think, really carry out that notion of, of doing small things in great love, hmm. being a leader who passionately is able to meet people at whatever level they're at, to um, see each moment as God's gift and right. to be faithful in it, to mm-hmm. um, just really say this, this, the kingdom unfolds according to these rules. And, and I think for me it is, no matter what success has come, being the person who is equally grateful if you're receiving an award in front of a crowded banquet room, and also being grateful, having a cup of coffee right. with someone who just came off the streets right. and, and really saying, these are equal moments. Mm-hmm. They're equal that's precious moments. I mean, that's moments. so countercultural. Yeah. Right. That's the culture of the kingdom. Yeah. It's so opposite. It to, is. I think you are a wonderful kingdomist, by the well, way. Th- thank you. I like that and, phrase. Uh, I hadn't heard that lovely, phrase. It's lovely, isn't but it? But I love it because it's what I want to be. That's my drumbeat yes. is that, uh, you know, I often I've stopped because of my wife's encouragement. <laughs> I kind of get, but I used to joke about when Jesus began his ministry. Out of, you know, after being baptized in the River Jordan, you see the Trinity presence. Yes. And then he's tested, he comes out, and his first words out of his mouth are, repent for the assemblies of God is at hand. You know? <laughs> I did that once at a minister's meeting, and some of the older guys are like, what did he just say? Because, of course, the yes. default response is, right. amen, amen, because right. I think you're right. quoting yes. the scripture. Yes. And then after this, a chuckle. Why Delray is so essential. <laughs> <laughs> she is, more than it's a. No, and, and, you know, and then talk about, I mean, the first words out of yeah. his mouth were, change your thinking because change I'm your, bringing something yes. Not only new, it's re- it's the original, it's real and true. And, 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 and to, to continue to revel in the new, even when it's so deeply familiar. So, right, you right. know, we're having this conversation as we embark upon Advent, in preparation for Christmas, to absolutely live in marveling at yeah. the fact that yeah. when the King Beautiful. of Glory came, mm-hmm. he came as a mm-hmm. poor homeless yeah. child. It's amazing. Right? Mm. In a manger. Now, this has to continue to be embedded. It yes, has that's to very good come example. into my mind when I find myself being upset that that meal wasn't worthy of me. Right. Or this accommodation mm-hmm. is less than I deserve. To, to come back and, and, and find the, the power and the liberty and the joy of saying, no, the, the king of glory right. came. Perfect. That That when when, when the angels could go to any place in the world to declare this news, they, they choose mm-hmm. these disenfranchised shepherds mm-hmm. and to say, don't run past those right. teachings. Right. Right? And it wasn't a marketing ploy. It wasn't no. a social media strategy because no, this, this no. will get him in tune with the people. Right. No. It was just a reality, just that a reality. He, which was outside of his choice, by the way. Mm. You know, him being in the manger yeah. was his parents' choice. And who were forced into that? It was circumstances beyond their control. Yes, absolutely right. right. Yeah. And um, right. and throughout his life, there's never a word of well, you know, when I was young, I really suffered. We were right. really poor. Any of yeah. that stuff, and he just embraces it. Yes. Uh, he just embraces it. So let me ask you this final question, sure. and thank you for it's been fun. Uh, Thanks, just Lorenzo. such depth and so much stuff to. I'll have to listen to this several times to to glean everything out of it. Um, what advice would you give to our listeners, uh, bearing in mind that many of them come from completely yes. different backgrounds and cultures? So there are people on every continent listening to this. If you were just speaking to them as leaders, what are the two or three things that you would say, as a leader, this is my advice to you? Mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, I had shared kind of those three principles and I would really bring people back to that. Mm-hmm. It is really what leaders do. Leaders cannot control circumstances. Mm-hmm. What they do is they continue to develop eyes and ears and hearts Beautiful. for opportunities in the midst Beautiful. of circumstances mm-hmm. that are there, whether they are favorable, whether it's headwinds or tailwinds. Mm-hmm. You know, we often think when, when the Wright brothers discovered 
built not only a plane but discovered flight. They discovered the great paradox that you take off into a headwind. Mm-hmm. What they really learned Beautiful. was that what flight was was not having ideal flight conditions, mm-hmm. but learning how to harness conditions as they unfold. Beautiful. That's what they wow. went out to the Outer Banks of North that's Carolina cool. and discovered. That's what birds did. That's cool. And so when they they were not only the inventors of the plane, they were the first test pilots, and they realized mm-hmm. you have to develop wings and flight patterns that. Mm-hmm. Use turbulence Very and good. use headwinds mm-hmm. for lift. Beautiful. So leaders do that. Mm-hmm. Leaders, if the leader has a tailwind, he or she moves with that tailwind right. and says, "Thank you, this is great." But if it's a headwind, mm-hmm. how do I get lift from this? Right. Okay. So I, I think there's just that passion, mm-hmm. I, and I think the other is just to really realize that leadership is not these special moments. It is. It is the ordinary moments mm-hmm. that are always seen as rich in potential. Yeah. I, I think that it would be that discipline, mm-hmm. that developing the discipline to say, I'm on all day. And this this is actually not draining, but exhilarating. Right. And I am going to see every moment. It's what feeds you. Right. I'm going to see every moment as holding for me potential for impact. Because otherwise, we're calculating opportune moments Mm -hmm. based on a pragmatic analysis Mm -hmm. of conditions and no one's that smart right the only way to offset that is to treat every moment as the moment Mm -hmm. so i I would really encourage them with with those things and and then just to 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 encourage them to just embrace the discovery i have to say it from a human from a biblical perspective that God's call for men and women is is for flourishing mm-hmm. and God is not a competitor mm-hmm. for flourishing right he mm-hmm. actually it is only in in understanding him that we can truly flourish right. and um, that's an exciting journey no matter how difficult mm-hmm. it's it's intervals or its season can be Amen. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks, Lorenzo. You blessed us. Great questions, great dialogue. (laughs) Thanks for including me. It's our pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Thanks so much for listening. I loved having you with us. And if you would like to know more, check us out at liveunique.biz. You can also find me on Instagram as liveunique. And you can find me as well on Twitter at L-I-V-U-N-Q. Thanks very much. Until next time.